feel the tension in the room building. Yeah. <laughs> no, the doors are closed. Let's just get going. All right. Welcome to Build, everyone. Great to be here. My name is Mark Fussell, and I'm a program manager that works on the Azure Service Fabric team. And I'm Jeffrey Richter. I'm a software engineer on the Service Fabric team. Uh, and the thing is that it, today's a super exciting day for us. Today, we GA'd Service Fabric on Windows <laughs> Azure. And so you know, this is a fantastic day. And you know, we're just the two guys on stage, but you realize there's a massive team of, well, not a massive team, no, but there's like a team of people behind us. Total, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's been a multi-year effort to get this out here. And we are so excited that we can give you the same runtime bits that we build our own services with and make you achieve the same sort of uh, services that we build in terms of the scale. So it's a great, exciting day for us. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on what this microservices thing means. Um, and then we'll go in and dive through and look at how we use Service Fabric and do lots of demos. So you know, what we discovered inside Microsoft as we built these cloud native services, there were three things that were important. One is that we had to have teams that became more agile and they could ship more frequently as they shipped a service. We had to also had to deliver features on a regular cadence. And then we realized that different parts of the application scaled in different ways. And so this microservice trend in the industry is all about really how you're building a, a cloud service that actually allows you to achieve these characteristics. You know, agility, frequent updates, and nothing epitomizes it more than a SQL team that's gone from like only shipping a box product every few years to shipping a service in the cloud that they update on a daily basis using service fabric as the underpinnings of all of that. And it's interesting just to compare and contrast, you know, where you have this, some of the traditional architectures and what it means for uh, microservices. You know, traditionally and typically you build these sort of monolithic approaches, which is a fine approach for building applications. There's nothing wrong with this. But you, know, you have these tiered architectures where you typically have a database tier, a middle tier of some business logic processing, some client web frontier. Uh, you tend to have some dedicated machines that you know about. These are my uh, database machines. These are my middle tier machines. You build a, you, you componentize everything wonderfully, uh, but you still end up with sort of just deploying a few X's across them all. If you contrast that with how you build a native cloud service and how you think about this from a microservices approach, here what you're trying to enable is this elastic compute infrastructure. We have a cluster of machines that you can scale up, scale down, and then you build individual pieces of services. Each service being able to be deployable, upgradable, versionable, built by small teams who can deploy this across the infrastructure for machines. But of course, you want a platform to take care of all the hard work of making care, ensure that your services are deployed, upgraded, and managed, and all of that. So that's where you have to think about, you know, what's your microservices platform? What's the thing that you're going to focus on to help you achieve to build all these services? And the platform has got to have a lot of characteristics. I mean, just a bunch of VMs is not going to work because you're in a world of hurt and pain. You need a platform to do all the things that you want from a microservices application architecture. And you want to be able to say, I want to bring all my skills to that. I want to be able to use any programming models, any frameworks, um, my existing languages I have. And at the same time, I want to have this platform to be able to deploy in multiple different environments. I don't want to be just restricted to one cloud provider. I want to have on-premise. I want cloud. I want everything. I want my cake and eat it. Um, and that's exactly what Service Fabric does. Uh, we've had this distributed systems platform that we've built lots of our internal services with, Azure databases, DocDB, Event Hubs, IoT Hub, Intune, Skype for Business. There's many of them, many core Azure services as well. And we build all of them against different uh, sets of, you know, our programming models against that, and then deploy this into different infrastructures. So we're super excited. This is how, you know, and this has naturally occurred as we've transitioned these services to the cloud. So at this point, you know, Jeffrey, why don't you tell us a bit more about what it means to have a cluster? Sure. So uh, what I show on this slide here, the box on the right represents some data center. That data center could be in Azure, or it could be an on-premises data center, or it could be a kind of a data center that you set up in someone else's cloud, like Amazon, for example. And inside this data center, you would go and provision, um, in this case, I'm using five, but of course, we support up to many thousands of machines. These can be individual PCs, or they can be virtual machines. On each of these machines, we have, you have to somehow get the service fabric bits installed. Now, if you use Azure to provision this, then we will get the service fabric bits on these machines for you automatically. Once the service fabric components are installed on all these machines or virtual machines, then you give them the IP addresses of each other so they can start talking to each other, and then this forms what we refer to as the cluster. So now we have this five-machine cluster over here in this example. 
Typically, you'll put in front of that a load balancer. And again, if you're hosting this in Azure, then Azure will provide that load balancer for you in front of that cluster. And then from the outside world, you can go and take your code, package it up as a software developer, send it up through the load balancer, and then, oops, that went too fast. Send it through the load balancer. It'll go to one of the machines, and that your code will be sent to Service Fabric, and then Service Fabric can go and deploy it to the other machines that are part of the cluster. So now your code is running on all these various machines. Then later, client requests, these are your customer requests, they can come in typically on port 80 or port 443 or whatever port you'd like. Again, they go in, they hit the load balancer, the load balancer directs it to your code running on one of these machines now, and then you, know, you can go and process the request and send it back. So that's kind of the, you know, the overview architecture of setting up service fabric in various different kinds of data centers and how your code gets deployed there and then your customer requests, client requests get directed to it. So um, from the, we're going to take a closer look now at the developer story about what it's like to build these kinds of microservices and package them up and then use Service Fabric to get that deployed to the nodes of your cluster. Um, I have an example app that we're going to be used to drive this discussion. My example uh, application consists of three microservices. The first microservice, and in Service Fabric terminology, we call these service types. But the first microservice is basically a website. And I wrote this website using Node.js. Uh, and uh, Node.js, of course, doesn't know anything about Service Fabric per se. And in Service Fabric, we would say that we're going to deploy this as a stateless guest executable, or just a ex guest executable for short. So this is some existing code. It doesn't know anything about Service Fabric. And we're going to package it up and give it to Service Fabric to go and deploy and monitor throughout the various nodes of our cluster. Now, I have another service or microservice that's part of my application, and this is my API gateway. This is a C-sharp application, and this is written using a service fabric programming model, which we call stateless reliable services. This is written in C-sharp, and uh, there's good Visual Studio tooling to help create these kinds of projects and to package them up and to deploy them with service fabric. And then my third and final microservice that's part of my application is this one which I call the auction. This whole thing is an auction demo where customers can register with the auction service and then they can go and create items that they wish to sell on auction and then other people can go and bid on other people's auction items and so on. So this last service type, which I call the auction, this is a stateful reliable service and it uses a technology I'll talk more about later called reliable collections. This is also written in C Sharp or .NET and this is where where all the customer information is being stored and where all the auction items are being stored and all the bids are all being stored in this last part of the service here. Now I take these three microservices or service types, as we call them in Service Fabric, and we kind of wrap them together in a thing which we call an application type, and we give that a name. And I've called it SF Auction, which stands for Service Fabric Auction. So now that's kind of the overview of it. But let me switch over to Visual Studio uh, wrong instance, right over here. And in Visual Studio, I'll just show you in the Solution Explorer on the right what we have. Um, first, I have a folder here. This is just some DLLs that I've created that are shared between some of these various projects. These are just regular .NET DLLs, nothing specific to Service Fabric there. There's this application project that I did create. This is a, the application type that I just showed you on that slide for the application overall. And inside here, underneath this application package root folder, this is my website code over here. This is my node for Node.js server. This is my server.js file, which is the JavaScript that runs for my node. This is just a, again, doesn't, this part doesn't know anything about service fabric. I just copied these relevant files into a subdirectory for this application package. Then I have my two other microservices. This one is this API gateway. Again, this is written in .NET. It's just a regular .NET executable, but it does reference some Service Fabric DLLs. And then I have this auction one. This is also a regular .NET executable that references some um, Service Fabric DLLs too. And that's basically what I have inside Visual Studio. I can then easily take this, right click here, and I could package it and I could publish it up to a Service Fabric cluster. I think you're back. Uh, well, so well, oh, no, I'm you back. should talk about yeah. <laughs> yes, let's talk about right. how you're deploying this <laughs> inside your environment. Right. So that was what I just walked you through. Now was the build time or design time artifacts. 
Uh, so now I would take that and I would publish it into a cluster. So that's what this slide shows here. So I show the cluster on the right hand side and when I deploy this into an Azure data center, we use two different VM scale sets. VM scale set number one is my state list tier and that is the tier that's immediately behind the load balancer. So client requests can come in from the internet and then can access the services or microservices that I have running there. Uh, that's where the website service, that's the Node.js one, will be running, and the API gateway. And you'll notice I can have a couple of different nodes. I can run a couple services on a single node, so that gives me high density. Whereas if you're used to things like cloud services, your different roles, each role would be on a separate virtual machine. And that would cause your cost to go higher. If I had two different roles and I wanted two instances of each roles, this would be four different virtual machines in cloud services. But with Service Fabric, I can run a couple of different roles all in a single virtual machine, which is what I'm doing here with the website and API gateway. Right now, I only show two nodes there, uh, but I could easily scale up my compute tier here to as ever many nodes that I need. My VM scale set number two is my stateful tier. That's my back end tier. It's not in front of the load balancer, so net internet traffic cannot directly reach it. And in those nodes, I have instances of the auction service. That's where the data is and the customer information and the bids. And that's my data tier there. And by adding nodes to that, I can easily scale up or scale down my data tier. Let's go and look at it. That's the best way to do it, isn't it? Okay. Oh, well, I did have a little bit more. So this shows here a client request that comes into the load balancer. Then the load balancer can go and direct it to a website. That would go and download an HTML file back to the client, which would be in a browser typically. And then when the user is working inside the HTML, the HTML requests would again go back to the load balancer. Those are RESTful requests, so they would hit my API gateway. Then my API gateway would see, oh, we're trying to create this user, or this user is trying to place a bid on this particular item. And those items I have partitioned out across the different nodes in the back end. So it would choose one of the auction instances to go and manipulate the proper pieces of data. Okay. And now, yeah, let's <laughs> switch over to back to my machine over here. Let me show you this all in action. So you can actually visualize it in the different environments, what it looks like. So just to appreciate what it means to create a cluster inside Azure, uh, you know, you can go into the Azure portal here. You can go into the uh, our resource groups here and create an Azure, uh, create a service fabric cluster here. You can fill out all sorts of characteristics in terms of um, the name of the node. You can choose all sorts of different types of VMs that you want to scale it over. Your cluster can be of different sizes. And at the end of all of that, and I've pre-provisioned some clusters in advance, you actually end up creating a service fabric cluster uh, which you can deploy all your applications to. So if I just return to my desktop here a moment and then open up this cluster here so you can see what one looks like. You'll see what a cluster is. It consists of a set of nodes here I've deployed. If I open up the resource group, it helps you appreciate what their Azure uh, cluster looks like. Because in effect, you get this VM scale set, you get a network uh, to span across all of those VMs to create the cluster itself. You get some storage for diagnostics and logs, um, and you get uh, public IP addresses to open up this to endpoint. So if we can dive in this now, built into all our deployments, whether you run it on-premise or you run it in Azure, we have this wonderful tool called the Cloud um, Service Fabric Explorer. And here's the Explorer view. Uh, for a cluster that we've deployed in Azure. And you'll see here, just as Jeffrey described here, I've got a, a seven machine cluster here. I've got five back end nodes and a couple of front end nodes. We've deployed his service fabric auction app into this. You'll see that this is the gateway here. This is the website. If you look at the website here, it's been deployed onto the front end nodes. Um, if you also look at the gateway service here, it too has been deployed to those front end nodes. And then where all of the heavy lifting happens in terms of the actual auction service itself, this gets deployed onto these back end nodes in a scaled out partition service across all of these. So this is my actual cluster that's running. This is my application deployed. Um, I can go in now and actually see the actual application running. And there it is, the UI for your first time. So this is hitting on that particular auction and I could buy... Uh, you sell some strange stuff. I know. Yes. I know. You got we had to pick and, things that weren't yes. copyrighted as yes. a trademark. <laughs> so this is the auction site. And on here, I can go and place bids for against all the auction items, and that sends requests through. Um, but of course, the beauty of Service Fabric is that it's not just an Azure thing. And there's lots of benefits for running in Azure. In Azure, you get automatic uh, upgrades to all of the runtime bits that are running on the machines. You get the ARM model for it to be deployed across those machines. And importantly, as well, as we coordinate with the underlying Azure infrastructure, so if host OS reboots come through, we pause back on those, push back on them, make sure your applications are made safe before host OS reboots go through on the VM. So 
When you run your Azure in cluster, it's made a lot more reliable and safe through the uh, interactions we have in the integration between um, Service Fabric and underlying infrastructure. However, um, of course, you can take Service Fabric and run it anyway. So I'm going to switch over to your machine, which is number eight. Eight. Um, and if I switch over to here a moment. So down here, I have an Azure data center. <laughs> Consisting well, of, sorry, you can't see around center, the corner right? there. There are five <laughs> laptops networked together with an um, with a IP router in between them all. And this is my mini data center I set up just before I came in here earlier. And if I go to this mini data center running down here, you'll see that this is on a, Je Jeffrey's got his laptop joined onto a local network. And this is the same view here of the Cluster Explorer that I can log into. Here is uh, the same set of machines. You see I have fixed IP addresses on them. This is Server Fabric Demo 1, 2, 3. I gave them all fixed IP addresses. And I've put together my mini data center from laptops. So we don't have to roll a big rack on stage like some people have to. We can just find something under your desk and build your own cluster, your own data center. And just as we've done before, we can attach to this. And on the same piece of We've deployed exactly the same application running here on the same IP, you know, see the IP address here, same app, just different environment. But, uh, you know, that's not all we want you to do with different environments. I'll just switch back to my machine here, which was seven. If I can press the right button, seven. You know, I showed you it in Azure here. Let's go and show you another one here, another cluster. Here's another cluster. Here's a cluster now where we've taken those on-premise bits and we've gone up to our great friends up in the Northwest. We've taken some VMs from them. We've installed uh, that on-premise installation on those VMs. And we've created a cluster that's running in Amazon. So if you want to take Service Fabric and you want to go and run it in other cloud providers, we're perfectly happy with that. Service Fabric runs anywhere. And of course, just like we did there, we attached to this endpoint inside this. <laughs> this is cool stuff. And here it is, Service Fabric auction app running in Amazon. Let me just make sure that I really make sure that you see that URL. You see, that is that URL of that <laughs> app running in Amazon. So you can run this anywhere. But, and I'm going to do one more thing here as well. We want to make sure that you really, truly run this anywhere. <laughs> so here we have. Now we're going to open up a Linux session. And if I log on on this, and I get the right password, here I have Service Fabric running on the Linux box. I can do a little shit grep, and you'll see Service Fabric um, our runtime running on this machine here. This is a single box at the moment. We can do this in multi-cluster mode as well. If I just take this IP address inside here, just to show that it's real, and if I go up and open up this IP address in here, and just go to our management endpoint, again, what you'll get and you'll see is you'll see the Service Fabric Explorer. Um, and this time, you'll see the same, sort of same set of nodes. This is a single box machine. Um, it's running on a cluster here, and I can deploy here Service Fabric running on uh, Linux environments. And therefore, we have now not just Windows, we have Linux machines. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, now, I will say that the Linux, uh, we, although we, the Azure is GA'd on, uh, we've GA'd on Azure, and uh, the on-premise is a preview. The Linux one is still in the private preview at the moment. So we're going to give you a link at the end if you want to join up to download all of these bits and try it all out. But then there is one more environment, isn't there, as well? There is one more. <clears throat> uh, and the other last environment that we have for you is the development environment. So when you install the Azure Service Fabric SDK on your machine, it goes and creates a cluster, basically, on your machine, on my Surface Pro up here. And if you look at the endpoint over here, if you can read that, it says localhost 19080. So this is a cluster that's running here, which gives me a really fantastic development experience so I can develop everything and test it. And the bits that I'm running on are the exact same bits that you would be running on if you were deployed onto actual metal or virtual machines. So it's not like an emulation environment. It's the actual environment. And here you can see I have my Service Fabric Auction app here, and I have the three services running, and I can just monitor the health and everything else that's happening right here inside the cluster. And not to be undone, just so you get to see these pictures one more time. Uh, here in the endpoint, you can see it's local host, and so I was able to just hit F5 in Visual Studio, deploy everything into the local cluster. I'm able to set breakpoints in the debugger, step through my code, and it gives me a really great debugging experience to build this before we start deploying it out to the other live clusters for production. Okay. 
All right, so now we're going to dive a little bit more, more into the programming models and what the capabilities are of the system. Um, we don't have, you know, there's only about 30 minutes left, so we can only go so far into it, but this should give you a really good sense of what's possible. So the service fabric itself is this platform, and the platform provides you certain capabilities that any and all programming models would provide to you. So one of, this is the list of some of the more salient ones. First, you're going to get fast deployment. Uh, it's much quicker for you to deploy your code into a service fabric cluster than it is using other technologies like uh, cloud services that's been in Azure for a while now. So the, the deployment and turnaround time for doing debugging and testing and you know, just getting new bits out there is much less than what it has been historically. Service Fabric gives you this ability to place things where you want them. You saw in my earlier slide, and well, the way we have it running in an Amazon cluster for real, is that I've created these two different VM scale sets. One VM scale set was my front end, which was right behind the load balancer. The other VM scale set was my back end. I can scale them independently from one another. You could have more VM scale sets if you had different node types for different size VMs, different number of CPUs, different number of RAM. Maybe for certain you know, roles or services, you want you know, this kind of hardware, and for other roles and services, you want this other kind of hardware. Um, it's very easy to create what we call placement constraints, and then you just upload your service, and Service Fabric will just put everything where it best fits based on what you've decided. Um, of course, Service Fabric gives you this great reliability, so if anything that while it's running fails for some reason, throws an unhandled exception, it will detect that, it will automatically restart it so that your service is back up again, ready to handle client requests. And that usually happens within, I mean, a second or less. Um, very high density. I made mention of this earlier where you know, it's very easy now to have multiple instances of services running on a single VM or node. So that gives you very high efficiency and it reduces your costs of running the service and having all those machines. You can now run the same kind of workloads with much fewer machines, which uh, means you're conserving money and you're running things more efficiently. Service Fabric has built into it health reporting. Uh, Scott Hansel made mention of this at the keynote this morning, where he showed where he was starting to do a deployment, and then he was upgrading, but then something was unhealthy, and it did this auto automatic rollback. That was exploding spaceships. Yes, it was yeah, exploding yeah. spaceships. Right? It was very fun to watch. Uh, he did a great job. Um, so Service Fabric does have this uh, rich health reporting mechanism that's built into it, and you can build uh, these watchdog applications that monitor the health of your own services, whatever that means for you, and you can record health, and then that health gets integrated in with the whole upgrade process, which is uh, very nice to have. And then that brings us to the coordinated upgrades is this last thing here, which again was shown where we have these update domain rollouts, and then we have rollback if something should fail, and so on, so that you're able to do these upgrades with zero downtime to your customers that are actually accessing your service. Now, I mentioned earlier I have this service type, which is my website. That was my first microservice. It's a stateless guest executable that was written in Node.js. Because it itself doesn't know anything about Service Fabric, it is getting those features for free. Just by having Service Fabric deploy that, it is now tapping into those additional features. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about this guest executable. So it really is just a Node.js thing, the way you would normally do that. But then to package it up for Service Fabric, you have to create what we call a Service Manifest XML file. And uh, this is a portion of what that XML file looks like, it, although it's actually that's kind of the whole thing in its simplest form. There's additional things you could put here. But the thing to really draw your attention to is the part that I put in bold here with the XE host. This is where we say to Service Fabric, uh, and then this XML file gets uploaded into the cluster, of course. This is how we say to Service Fabric that when you're ready to create instances of this service, that copy the code in that directory up to that node, and then start running this executable node.exe, and then pass to it as a command line argument server.js. And that was, of course, my JavaScript file, which was my server code. And now Service Fabric is able to go and just deploy this thing and just start to get it running. Um, by the way, I don't want to go into it in great detail, and it's not actually shipping yet, but we're working on this, and we will have it very soon, that in the future, you will be able to deploy containers basically the same way. Um, and for Windows, we'll need the next version yeah. of Windows Server to ship. Yeah. Well, just to be clear, yes. let's be clear, once, uh, once Windows Server 2016 ships, is the nearest container thing that we have right now, you'll be able to deploy Service Fabric onto Windows Server 2016, and there you'll be able to just launch Docker Cont containers, because it will launch Docker images inside Windows containers, I should say, um, and just by simple declarative like mechanism like this. So if all you need is a bunch of containerization 
and an orchestration engine to deploy it across a skeleton of machines running in any you know, different environment, you know, Service Fabric can just achieve that. Yes, and as you can see, it's just as easy. You'll just change the XE host to container host, and instead of the program, you just give the image name uh, and then any commands you want to, and then we'll be able to go and deploy those containers and get them up and running. Okay, so that's our uh, first programming model, these guest executables. Now, if you want to start getting more uh, into Service Fabric and start writing some code that is Service Fabric specific, our next programming model is this one called Reliable Services Programming Model. And well, you get a few additional features with that. You get the ability for your service, after it initializes, to publish an endpoint so that other services running within the cluster can go and query this naming service that we have and can discover the endpoint. And sometimes Service Fabric will move your instances around from node to node. And as they move, the endpoint will change. So every time your instance starts running, it will publish a new endpoint for where it is now into the naming service. And then other services running in the cluster can query that, get the latest endpoint, and then communicate with it directly so there's no additional overhead. We also have um, dynamic resource balancing based on actual resource usage. So if you are start using our programming models and our APIs specifically, then your service can start reporting things like, this is how much CPU use I'm using. Um, I have a queue in my service, and this is how many elements are in the queue, the, how big the queue has gotten. Uh, and you can pick really any metric you want. In fact, it's, it's really just a string to us. So you can define your own metrics with their own uh, integer values. And then periodically, they get aggregated into the cluster. The cluster can see which services are using the most of certain resources, and then can move services around throughout the cluster in order to rebalance. It's a very powerful uh, mechanism that's available to you there to really leverage the resources that you have in an efficient way. So things like if it's memory usage or if you're using disk usage, you can exactly. report all those up. And as a result, make decisions about where we make the service make decisions about where best to run your apps. Yes? Exactly. Yes. Uh, then we support, and as Mark said earlier, we are hoping that a lot of people will create lots of different programming models, uh, and they can build that on top of Service Fabric. So we have an actor pattern that's available, but we'll be shipping that. And we're also going to support Web API with the next uh, ASP.NET when it comes out. Uh, so you'll be having those, but we are hoping that third parties are will be able to create a bunch of different programming models on top of this platform. And it won't just be Microsoft only. Yes. Yes. Lots of programming models <laughs> integrated onto the platform in any languages. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, you also, with our programming models, you get the Visual Studio support, like the F5 debugging. You set breakpoints. You can look at local variables, stack traces, things like that. Uh, we have in Visual Studio, we have uh, the debugger panes that capture diagnostic events. So if you're doing ETW event logs, they will appear inside Visual Studio. So you can see everything that's happening there. And then Visual Studio has some additional tooling for packaging up your manifest files and all your code so that you can deploy it into the cluster and then you can uh, publish it into the cluster. And Visual Studio has integrated tooling for all of that. My second microservice, uh, this, which had the service type of API gateway, that is using this programming model here. Uh, and so we're going to take a, a short look at the code or what's necessary in order to make this work. So let me switch over to Visual Studio, and I'll go to my project here. And this is my gateway project. And inside here, um, there's a few source code files. We're not going to walk through all of that, of course. I'm just going to show you the most salient part. Uh, if you're familiar with working with Azure Cloud Services, the programming model here is actually quite similar. Just like with cloud services, there was a role entry point base class, and you would create a class derived off of it. We have a stateless service base class, and then you create a class that is derived off of that. And then this base class has just a handful of virtual methods on it that you can choose to override. The two that are the interesting ones are this one called create service instance listeners. This, we will call this method when your instance starts up, and then you can return back to us a collection of zero or more listeners. So you might want to listen on a TCP endpoint for, some in, for client requests. You might want to also, or instead of, your choice, listen on an HTTP endpoint for client requests. And you can create a bunch of listeners here and return that collection back. And then we will open all those listeners. And then when the client request comes in on those ports, then you will receive those notifications, and then you can do any processing you want to in response to those. In addition to that, I was going to say we add. provide some out of the box listeners for you can use as well. Yes? That's true. We do some out of the box listeners. Um, another, in addition to that, we have a run async method. This is similar to the cloud services run method, uh, and this uh, typically, if you're 
If your service is listening for network requests, then typically you do not implement this, but you can if you'd like to. Um, this is more for the case where your service is maybe polling a queue somewhere, like maybe there's an Azure storage queue that has messages in it, and you want to have a, basically an infinite loop that goes to the queue, grabs a message, does some processing, goes to the queue, grabs a message and processing. And so after we open up the listeners, we will call run async, and you can do both of these or either one of these, whatever it makes sense for your service. Uh, and then this just kind of runs forever for the lifetime of your instance when it's running on that particular node. And that's, uh, that's the very simple version or overview of this programming model. Okay. Now the next and last programming model we have is the stateful one. Now to understand the stateful one, uh, I show on this slide here the traditional stateful architectures at the top, and then I show a new potential architecture that Service Fabric provides you at the bottom. Let me just close this out. All right, so at the top, client requests are coming into some service. Those client requests usually hit a load balancer first. Then they usually hit a stateless web tier. That stateless web tier then frequently talks to a stateless compute tier, which is where you have your business logic. That compute tier frequently needs to go and access some data. So that could be your stateful data tier. So for the stateful data tier, you could think of that as something like a SQL Azure database, or maybe you're using Azure storage tables, or maybe DocumentDB, or whatever storage mechanism you like. A lot of times, these stateful data tiers, they have some internal tiers of themselves. For example, Azure Storage is really a three-tiered service. There's the front-end tier, then there's the partitioning tier, and then there's the distributed file system tier. So you're making a quest to the front-end, but it internally is making requests to other tiers that are part of that service. Every time a request happens, one of those arrows, then there's some network latency that's involved because you're making a network hop between one tier and another tier. In order to improve performance, what a lot of people do is they will insert a cache on their stateless tier. So this way it reduces the number of network uh, requests that are being sent from the stateless compute tier to the stateful tier in order to try to improve the performance of their service. So this is the, a very typical scenario today that a lot of people use for managing or manipulating state with their services. Here's a new alternative that Service Fabric provides. With Service Fabric, the client request can come into the load balancer, same as they did before. The load balancer would then direct the traffic to your stateless web tier, same as it did before. But now the stateless web tier can go and talk to a stateful compute tier. In the stateful compute tier, you have your data and your business logic basically packaged together sitting on the same node. And so now the, you can go directly to that log state and do your business logic on it, and then return. No additional caching mechanism is required. No additional uh, external services that you have to manage or credentials, connection strings, and things like that. It is all sitting right here next to you. And that's, uh, this is a thing that you uh, can do with Service Fabric. So let's talk about that. This is what we would call the reliable collections programming model. Right? You're using our reliable collections in order to pull this off. With the Reliable Collections programming model, you are getting highly reliable and scalable state. And you're getting lower latency, right? so your software is running faster, compared to using some external storage mechanism, um, which is what you would have done in the past. And my final service, my auction service type, is a stateful reliable service using this Reliable Collection mechanism. And it's written in C Sharp to do that. <clears throat> Now, before I show you some of the code for that, let me just show you a little bit of like how the flow goes. So when the user goes to my website over here, they have the option of creating a new user. There's add new user over here, and then there's a dialog box that comes up where they can fill some information about the new user. That ends up making a REST API to my API gateway over here. My API gateway then looks at the email address, is what I use to register people with, to see who this person is. And based on the email address, I choose a partition. I have taken my, all the data that I have in the auction app, and I have spread it across some number of partitions. You get to pick the number of partitions you need based on the size of the data and costs and things like that that you'll have to think about for your own particular you know, domain problem. So right here, what I'm showing on the slide is just partition number one, let's say. In my partition number one of my auction service, I am using these reliable collections. And specifically, we have a class called Reliable Dictionary. And I have many instances of it. I have an instance of the Reliable Dictionary class that has all of the users for this particular partition. 
Uh, in the dictionary, the key is the user, like user1, user2. This would really be their email address. I just didn't have room to fit it on the slide. And then for each user, I also have all the items that that user is bidding on. And then for each user, I have a dictionary per user in addition, a, a reliable dictionary per user in addition. And this says for user one, they're selling an item A. For user one, they're selling another item called B. So these are the items that they are selling. And for each of these items, I keep the list of the expiration date for that item and all the people who have bid on that item so far. Uh, I also have an items list. This is actually a dictionary, but the value is always null. So I'm just using the keys of the dictionary. And this is keeping a current list of, on this partition, what are all the items that are currently active. And it's, again, another reliable dictionary, but I'm just treating it as a simple list. And as I mentioned, we have one dictionary for each user. So if user one had this dictionary of items they're selling, user two has this dictionary of items that they're selling, and so on. So these are all reliable dictionaries. And by putting this information in a reliable dictionary, Service Fabric is underneath the scenes replicating that data to other nodes in the cluster. So should any particular node experience failure or network connectivity issues, there are other nodes in the cluster that have this data, and then the service continues to function properly, which gives our service high availability to the cluster customers' requests that are coming in. And because it's an auction where people are in a frenzy to buy that Microsoft Band watch that I'm tired of looking the picture of because I've seen it for months, um, you know, be, because it's a reliable dictionary which has very low latency on it, the bidding can happen very, very quickly. So the API gateway, based on the email address that's being sent into it, it would determine which partition. And then it would go and talk to the dictionaries in that partition, and then it would go and send some data back. So now I'll show you what some of the code looks like to actually create the user in a reliable dictionary. Let me switch over back to Visual Studio. And this is my auction app over here. And this is happening in this file. In this code here, I have a method called createUserAsync. This is going to end up being called when a network request comes into this instance of my service running for a particular partition. And you'll notice it gets passed in here the email address. This is the email identifying the person that we wish to add into our internal database. And in my case, I'll be using a reliable dictionary. Um, I should show you up above, by the way, if I can find it easily. Here is, I inherit my class. Well, I should show you that too. And I have some time. So my class. Well, there's a base class called uh, stateful service. I showed you earlier there's one called stateless service. That's actually in a different file, not this one. And then that file has a, a, a base class uh, property on it called state manager, which is how I can go and access all the reliable dictionaries, and we also have reliable queues for this particular partition. When my service starts up, I go and create an instance of this helper class that I created, and I pass into it this state manager. That gives me access to all the reliable dictionaries and queues for this particular partition. And then I can go to the state manager, and I can say, go and look up for me a reliable dictionary, where the keys are this email structure that I have created. So this is a person's email address. And then I have some information about the user, some additional information, like when they join the service and what items they're currently bidding on. And then I give this dictionary a name. This is my users for a particular partition. So I called it partition users. Once I have that dictionary, and I save it into a field up here called m underbar users, then I can show you the code that I was about to show you before, create user async. In here, the user's email address comes in. I go and I turn it into my email structure, which just adds a little wrapper of uh, intelligence on top of the email address, kind of validates it, and so on. It's nothing to write home about. It's just a simple .NET structure. Then I call create transaction, because our reliable collection classes are all transacted to give you acid semantics on them. So you can do multiple operations across dictionaries and across queues within a single partition in a transacted way. So create transaction creates for me a transaction object that I can use to start doing these operations. I then new up a user information object uh, based on this user's email. So this includes some other data, like the time when the user is um, adding themselves to my system. I want to know their creation date. It also has in here the items, list of items that the user is bidding on. Initially, they're not bidding on anything, so that would be an empty collection inside this user info object. Then in my try block here, I take my reliable dictionary, which works very similar to other .NET dictionaries that you're used to using. And instead of calling add on it, we call add async. 
because it does some I.O. operations underneath the covers, and we don't want to block any of your threads, so using our stuff is very efficient. And you pass in here a transaction object, followed by what you want the key to be, followed by what you want the value to be, just like you would for any uh, normal dictionary. And this goes and adds it into the reliable dictionary. This also causes the information to be replicated to other nodes within the cluster. And then, don't forget, because we do support transactions, you have to call commit async. Otherwise, we'll actually just throw all that stuff away. If maybe an exception got thrown somewhere in this processing, as you're adding things, then it would all get thrown away like none of it happened. But if we get to the commit async and we call it successfully, then we know the information is stored and properly replicated. So if the node that was executing this code now goes down, that data is in the reliable dictionary. You can get it back out. Another node would become the primary node for a replica for this data, and then could start serving the data, and you could manipulate it over there. And then ultimately, I just return the user information back to whatever client code made this request to create the user. Uh, while we're here, I'll also show you my get user code. This is if we want to go look up a user to learn some information about them. This method over here, it gets the user's email address uh, that we're trying to look up. Um, again, I parse it into my email object. I go and create another transaction. I then go back to my reliable dictionary, and I call try get value async. I pass in the transaction object. I pass in the key, and then this will go and return to me the value back out. Um, this has a has value property on it because, of course, the key may not be in the dictionary. So if we're trying to look up somebody who's not there, this would return false. But if we look up somebody who is there, this would return true. And then we can go and grab the actual user information out of it and I mean, this just works like a nullable data types in .NET. And, uh, and then return that back to the caller. Otherwise, I throw an exception here saying the user didn't exist. Back out to the caller. And that gives you a pretty good indication of how easy it is to use our stuff. I see there's a question over here. You. How do we differentiate infrastructure exceptions? Well, exceptions that we throw are, come from a common base class, so that would be a way that you could detect that. If I, if I don't understand your question correctly, then let's ask it after the session. It's, it's more. But define infrastructure in your, we can't yes. do this right now. Yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let's make this, this real. Should we, but, why, why don't we, why don't we, have you, have you, should we fail one of those machines over? You want to fail a machine yeah, over? Yeah, let's fail one of those machines over. Okay, so. Why don't you, are you still logged onto that thing? Yes, I am, why are you over here? Pick a machine. Well, let's pick one that has some stuff on it. So if I pick, um, <laughs> let's see, the auction service instance. So my auction service instance here has five partitions. And if we open up the partitions, we can see, for example, that demo machine five has a primary on it and two five. secondaries. <laughs> five. So do you remember which one's five? I think this one's five. Let's see what happens. All right, so he's going to close that down. All right, so we're having trouble talking to it now. Oh. Okay. Is my cluster still there? I think so. Oh, it's hit F5. No. Oh, maybe you're yeah, connecting to machine five. It could be. Nah. <laughs> yeah. So you had to ask that question, and now? Uh, maybe I didn't get machine five. <laughs> uh, I mean, now what? One, 192, 168, it's not 101. Oh, no, here. No, oh, so no, it's your still, running. still running. Yeah, it's still running. <laughs> hit the management endpoint. Um, it's type 80 on there. 19080, right? Yes. Explorer. There's Explorer, okay, which node went down. Okay, so a node is down. Yes, which right? one is it? Oh, no, well, you just shut down node two. two. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't count, sorry. Oh, there was one. All right, well, okay. We killed one. Uh, your auction app kept going, though, didn't it? Well, it's running, yeah. It's running. <laughs> so. I'm sure we got so, one yeah. of the partitions, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, there's, I mean, now I don't, I, I can't tell now which one may have had a primary yeah. on two. Okay. Right, but, <laughs> but see how beautiful it all works? <laughs> all right, I'm, let me turn it back over to you. And, uh, and we, we could do the same inside, I, I mean, if I flipped over and run into, uh, on Azure, you can very easily just kill off nodes inside there, as you kill machines, you see primaries fail over, I killed a laptop down there, we could, we could kill another one, and it'll still run, we're gonna pick another one. We Go on, we'll do it. We'll do, it. <laughs> do you care which one? I'm just going to close this one. My foot. I'll tell you what, we'll do another one at the end when we got time. <laughs> um, so, we want to just thank hundreds of hundreds of customers that we had in our preview program. 
Uh, we couldn't have done shipping GA without them. This is just a collection of all the ones that have built services that were inside there. We typically want to do a call out to these customers who were very closely partnered with, who all started to produce production services. Um, you heard BMW and Schneider Electric both in the keynote this morning. Um, and they were ones that you know, helped ship services. And you know, we worked very closely with them, just building applications, designing their applications with them, and making sure we had the whole stability in the program. And I particularly want to invite onto stage now uh, ben Adams from Illy Riyadh Games. Uh, you saw a taster of what they did this morning inside the keynote, and I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper in the chance here just to explain a little bit more about what they've done. So thank you, Ben. What's the slide? Uh, one machine yeah. number. Six. No, 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 no. It's this one that's still. Oh, you want to stay on that? Yeah, this one. Oh, right. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Quickly. Yeah, go. Um, you can use space this. bar, mouse, the clicker. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am Ben Adams from Illyriad Games, and we're building Age of Ascent on Service Fabric. We were an independent game studio specializing in massively multiplayer games. So um, human interaction and ingenuity drive and shape our world. So our aim is to make games that aren't limited by, by scale. It's the more people that can interact together, it makes a much more compelling experience in games. So we don't want artificial boundaries on scale. Um, we, we just want to be able to go as large as possible, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, so a single contiguous universe without limit on uh, servers or sharding. And to do that, we, we take a sort of born in the cloud approach. So servers are a resource. They're not a feature. Um, we go f with Azure, we have hyperscale, which allows us to um, scale up on demand and scale back down as we fold and unfold space based on player density, which gives us cost effectiveness um, with the, the high density that Service Fabric gives us. So we can have hundreds of thousands of running services that all exist in a compact density all on the same nodes. Um, this also means the, the fast adaptableness of service fabric and the scaling allows us to respond to unanticipated loads. So if two alliances go to war and uh, immediately coalesce in one area of space, we can start scaling up straight away and instantly respond and have the resources available to, to deal with that, this, the scale of battle. Um, it, uh, we need it to be fault tolerant so that the user experience is always seamless, no matter, you know, like a swan, no matter what's going on underneath the water, it's all just smooth sailing, and we're respecting the user's time, so it's always um, completely up and um, a smooth experience. And so we need that each service to be individually upgradable without any um, sort of downtime. And one of the, one of the special things that Service Fabric gives us, and one of the things we were, we were seeking for, looking for, was um, the data scales with compute. Data doesn't become your bottleneck. Generally, in a tr uh, traditional system, you could scale up your, your top public-facing tier, but you, know, you might be attached to one database, and it becomes a problem to start scaling that out and replicating it across uh, places. It's a, it's a really hard problem, um, and there, there's a sort of certain whiff of PhD about, about service fabric and how it works, but it's all nicely commoditized and the programming model is very simple and you, can, you don't have to, you, um, the way it makes it, it's very accessible to use and you don't have, um, it, it's not very complex to, to leverage that in your system. Um, so, some numbers, what does it mean to us? We're, we're empire building, we're gonna have economic price wars, but what you saw in the keynote today is we have real-time space Twitch combat with um, hundreds of thousands of users in a single battle, even though the, the world itself is um, millions of players concurrently. Um, and so, as, as it was said, we've tested 50,000 simultaneous battles in real time in the uh, same combat, and that was a 
around 267 million network messages a second, which is about 23 trillion a day, although it's PVP, so hopefully they all kill each other off and, you know, <laughs> keep our bandwidth costs down. Um, right, if I just flip okay, into... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Um, so if I just go into the architecture, this currently we're composed of 32 microservices. Um, we have the, the two purple boxes at the top are the stateless services. They're, they perform our routing. So that's where the player comes in um, on whatever device they are. It determines, it asks Service Fabric where the, the various other stateful services are to communicate with, um, and it routes the, the messages between them. And then uh, we have this stateful services, which the game functions in, in purple, and there are, sorry, not purple, green. They're um, sort of really, really important data, so commerce, uh, player accounts, alliances, the, the, this data can't, can't be lost. So we have failover, replication, all provided by Service Fabric. And we're just using a programming model you already know, which is you know, dictionaries, but with the addition of transactions. Um, an interesting one is our trade industry and production, which actually they live, which you sort of briefly saw um, this morning, they live in the same um, microservice because the transaction actually goes across um, the, the part there. The transactions actually cross all three. So if you're doing some trades or inventory, arranging your inventory or putting things in production, then um, the, the transaction state crosses all three of those functions. Um, and then we have our physics service, which is the one in red, which is also a stateful service. And that's the really high frequency um, part. OK, now, I think. Number six. So, I just um, just to show you what what our setup looks like. So these are our projects for our 32 microservices, and that is a, a one-to-one -one relationship with the microservices set up in the cluster, as you can see here. And if I just flip to Service Fabric Explorer, you can see. Uh, what you can see I have a 40-node cluster here. Um, if we just have a look at the map. And you can see that they're, they're spread across five fault domains and five upgrade domains across there. So that's all the, the 40 uh, nodes in that cluster. And again, you can see um, the application is all the microservices there on the left. And there. Uh, their health state is healthy. Um, I'll just show you quickly, just to remind you if you didn't catch it, uh, what the gameplay looks like, just to summarize. So if I just forward through. So it's, it's quite fast-paced. Um, space combat is sort of how it all ties together. This is the, the user experience. It's a little bit different from Service Fabric Explorer. <laughs> um, We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it gives you an idea. Auction app, this app. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so go back to what's this? Um, that's, that's all for me. I have a talk uh, later with our CEO, James Nieswand, at um, 5.30 in the main theater. Uh, 5 uh, sorry, 5.10 in the main theater. Yes, yeah, so if you want to find out some more, you can come down and find you then, and you can go into a bit more depth on that. Thank you very much, Ben. That was fantastic for you coming up on stage. Thank you. You just need to laugh from the other time. So that's kind of it for us. Um, you know, this was a pretty much a taster. We tried to cover, show you how you deployed across multiple environments. You saw Azure, you saw on-premise, you saw our mini data center. We're going to kill another machine in a moment. You saw it running on other clouds. Uh, you're running on your laptop. Uh, you saw a taster of our programming model. You can run all sorts of other frameworks as well as the frameworks we provide. Um, and you know, we've had a lot of partners help us get to this point in time. It's super exciting for us. We encourage you to download the SDK. Uh, you can download the Windows Server install to install it on Windows Server machines, like I demonstrated over here with that link. Um, our samples help people do educate more. There's a bunch of videos and samples we've been releasing. 
Uh, and if you want to sign up for the Linux preview to become part of the partner program for that, as we look towards an end, a, uh, a release sometime in the summer for a public preview for that, please kind of sign up at this link. Um, and hopefully this has made you appreciate you know, the wonderful platform that we have here. And we want you to be, as developers, to go out there and build some great applications and build them and run them at scale. So thank you very much indeed. We have time for, wow, look, we have, we have time for questions. So We've feel free on. to use the microphones to ask questions. Um, and yeah, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are.